at the early service, uh, we have a prayer time before that service, and, and in the prayer time, um, Micah acknowledged that I didn't go the direction that he thought uh, maybe I should or would or could have uh, with the scripture text this morning. And, um, and that's just a good reminder for all of you. This particular section in Ephesians chapter 2 is filled is filled with all kinds of really important things. I'm just going to focus on the last couple of verses here. So I want to commend it to you. It's a type of section that you may want to read every day this week and just see what God has to say to you because I believe God could have something to say that's different each day and is just for you. So I just kind of wanted to give that little uh, kind of explanation. Why aren't you, Pastor Doug, talking about being saved by grace? Why aren't you talking about this, you know, being children of wrath? Why aren't you talking about this and that and the other thing, you know? Because I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to focus on this because this is where the Holy Spirit's led me. So I want to take you back, early part of my life, um, elementary school, and um, uh, there was a question being asked all around elementary school, and the question was this, what are you going to do when you get out of school someday? Well, I have a confession to make to you. I did not know the answer to that question in the third grade, okay? I didn't know in the third grade. But things got worse. In middle school, the question was asked more frequently, very frequently, and asked. The teachers administered all kinds of aptitude tests and career fitness tests and all kinds of other assessments to figure out what I was going to do when I got out of school someday. And as if all those tests weren't enough, they even had us meet one-on-one -on -one with guidance counselors. <laughs> It's terrible. <laughs> terrible, you know? They all ask the same question. But I did not know the answer to the question in the eighth grade. That frustrated them, and it kind of frustrated me too. And then I got to high school. You would think at some point all these educators would get a clue and stop asking this ridiculous question about what you're going to do when you get out of school. But they didn't stop. Now there were other people asking the question too, teachers and coaches and co-workers and there were parents and relatives and friends. They were all asking the same question. What are you going to do when you get out of school? I just wanted to scream. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. See, I think the problem is the question that was being asked. What are you going to do? I think what is the wrong question. I think the more important question is why are you going to do whatever you do? But we get focused on the what question because in some ways it's easier. It's easier. But if we get too focused on the what question, then we never get around to ask the why question. And that's important. The what question so often focuses upon position or promotion or power. It, it might focus on things like image or influence or maybe even something more insidious and evil. I don't know. But the why question is different. It always focuses upon God's purpose for my life. Before I pour my life into umpteen years of college and tens and thousands of dollars of debt, or I chase after a career for 40 or 50 years, I want to know, I want to know what this has to do with God's purpose for my life. That's what I want to know. I don't know about you. Without a clear vision of why you're doing what you're doing, you will jump from one project to another, one task to another, one job to another, one relationship to another. There is something deep down in our soul, I think we're hardwired this way by our Creator, that needs to know that what I'm doing with my life has purpose, and in particular, is aligned with God's purpose for my life. So let's look at Jesus. Let's look at Jesus. Jesus was absolutely clear about his purpose. Absolutely clear. 
Mark chapter 1, verse 38, Jesus says, we must go to the new... Beer, new I get paid to talk, but that's hard. <laughs> Let me start over. Maybe, Bentley, I'll have you come up and read it for us. But uh, we must go to the nearby towns so that I can tell the good news to those people. And then look at that next part. This is why I have come. This is why I have come. Jesus could have fulfilled that in many, many different ways, a whole variety of different things, but the why is clear. And because he was so clear about the Father's purpose, he was able to keep his focus and to chase after that purpose. Even when he made great, uh, met great resistance, even when his own followers were saying, are you sure about all of this? He could still stay focused. He could still stay focused. In John chapter 10, verses 10 and 28, Jesus again describes the Father's purpose for his life. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. That's the why. Jesus could live that out, the what, in all kind of different ways, but the why was very clear for his life. And that was to offer abundant life now and the promise of eternal life in heaven. That's the why. That's the why. When we're clear about the why, then the what can be all kinds of different things. But the challenge here in discerning God's purpose is that we don't believe we're unique. We don't believe we're special. We really are not certain that we are a child of God. And that's the challenge in trying to be really clear about God's purpose. So instead of landing on God creating us and making us unique and special and one of his children, instead what we do is we compare ourselves to other people. Teenagers are really, really good at this, okay? They get up in the morning, they look in the mirror, and they say, oh boy, I don't have as nice a hair as so-and-so. I don't have uh, the same kind of nice nose that so-and-so has, you know. I don't have the same kind of smile that so-and-so But you know what? We don't ever grow out of that either. Adults do the same thing. We compare ourselves to somebody else. And we fall into the trap of comparing ourselves to the standards of other people rather than comparing ourselves to the standards of Jesus' love. And there is a huge difference in the two of those. If you're comparing yourself to other people, you will always fall short in those comparisons. So you will always feel inadequate. Your self-esteem will always be low. You'll always feel like you're defeated or a failure, all those kind of things. But if you compare yourself to the love of Jesus for you, it'll be just the opposite. You'll feel strong. You'll feel valued. You'll feel like you belong. You'll feel loved. There's another option than just comparing ourselves to other people. And this is it. Jesus loves you so much that he created you very special and extraordinarily unique. Again, let's go back to our text, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I'm going to read this from a variety of translations, but uh, from the New International Version, it says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. We are the handiwork in other words, you were created by the hands of God. Whew. Another section of the scripture says that God is the potter and we are the clay. He makes us and molds us with his hands. And that means each and every one of us is special. Each and every one of us is unique. And each and every one of us has a purpose. In another translation, instead of saying we are God's handiwork, it says you are God's masterpiece. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are God's masterpiece, okay? Say that right now. Okay? You are the work of the Creator's hands. You are 
a masterpiece. You are a masterpiece. You are special and you are unique. You are a precious child of God. And when you finally get that embedded up here and in here and way deep down in your soul, then the pursuit of God's purpose for your life takes on a kind of new energy. So let's stop comparing ourselves to all of these other people around us. In his book titled Forward, Pastor David Jeremiah writes this, if you look at somebody else for the pattern of who you should be, you're missing something. If you look at somebody else for the pattern of who you should be, you're missing something. And the something you are missing is God's purpose for your life. Now let's talk about God's purpose. I think as many people as are here, there's that many different purposes. But God's purpose for every one of us will always involve loving and serving other people. Again, going back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul says, For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus. You are created by Christ Jesus for good works. That's to love and serve other people. And when we serve other people, we find the emptiness in our heart begins to be filled with a sense of God's purpose. And when we serve other people, we discover that there are opportunities to share the gospel with those who need a Savior. When we serve other people, we realize that they are a child of God, and so are we. In Mark 16, 15, Jesus tells us, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole of creation. Again, I think it's another way of Jesus telling us what God's purpose is for our life. We are to go into all the world and proclaim the good news, and the good news is that Jesus loves you, that Jesus died to forgive your sin, and Jesus rose from the grave to give you the assurance of heaven. So I can share that good news of the Savior if I work at the railroad, or if I work as a teacher, or if I work cattle during the calving season. I can still fulfill that purpose. I can, I can share the good news of the Savior if I sell cars at a car lot or serve burgers at McDonald's or clean bathrooms at the hospital. See, the what is not so much important. It's the why. It's the why. It's about God's purpose. Several of you have asked uh, what I'm going to do after I retire. Sounds a lot like that same question I was being asked in the third grade, you know. I just want to scream sometimes, but you keep asking, it's okay, I'll get over it. Well, I can give you this much of an answer. I know there will be some hiking in the mountains. I know there will be the making of new friends, and I guarantee you there will be some time spent enjoying a nice tea at Starbucks, okay? I know that. I know there will be more visits to see our kids in Oklahoma, more visits to see my mother in Lincoln, and no more church meetings. It sounds like a good time to me, right? <laughs> but beyond that, I'm not sure what we will do. I'm not sure what we will do. But I do know that what Cindy and I will end up doing will be living into God's purpose for our lives. And in some way, what that means is that we will invite people to love Jesus and we will help people grow deeper in their relationship with Jesus. Now, as you wonder about what I will do after I retire, I want to give you a challenge. Don't forget to ask yourself what you will do before you retire. Or if some of you are already retired, what you're going to do now, okay? But this is the thing. Jesus has something in mind for your life besides just pushing a time clock. He has a purpose is a purpose for you. What I do is far less important than why I do what I do. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your time doing things that don't matter. It's so important. Now is not the time to hesitate. Now is not the time to step back. Now is not the time to be passive. You are God's masterpiece. 
You are special, very special, and you are extraordinarily unique. Get this. God made you on purpose and for a purpose. You are created by Jesus Christ to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve other people. So how do I figure this all out? I didn't know in third grade. I didn't know in eighth grade. I'm not sure I knew when I was a senior in high school. But I figured some things out along the way. So here are a few things that are helpful in discerning the why. First, seek the advice or the counsel of other Christ followers. It is amazing how another Christ follower can see in us what we can't see very clearly. And over a cup of coffee, clarity can come. And sometimes they will say something that we never, ever thought about ourselves. So seek out the counsel of another Christ follower. And sometimes one other Christ follower is not enough. We need, we need a group of them and we just share what we need and then we ask for their input, their, their counsel there. And sometimes they might even lay their hands on our shoulder and pray for us for that kind of discernment. It's so helpful to listen for God's voice through other Christ followers. So that's the first. Second, take some time to read and study the Bible. I tell you that God speaks through the pages of this book. And he will help you if you just open it up and get into it some. And third, keep your mind and your heart open. You know, it does, it's not very helpful if you're seeking God's guidance or seeking the, the Spirit's leadership, but your mind is closed and your heart is closed to what they're saying. So keep your mind and your heart open for the next door the Holy Spirit is opening. So I'm going to leave you with this. You're children of God. Pursue God's purpose on purpose. Let's pray. Jesus, we... Thank you for your example. You were very clear about what the Father's purpose was for your life on earth, for your ministry on earth. And you never gave up. You never stepped back from that purpose. Oh, you expressed it in dozens and dozens of different ways. But the purpose was always very clear and the purpose was constant. To love and serve people to bring them close to your heart and to bring them ultimately into the kingdom of God. I pray, Jesus, that you would help us to have that kind of clarity about the purpose, your purpose for our lives. Some of us are very young and we're still trying to figure out all of this. Others of us are, are in our working years And we're kind of into this a ways. But we need to maybe need to recalibrate just a little bit. Maybe do some alignment, some realignment on some things. So that we're really clear about your purpose. And we're living strong into that. And others uh, here are, are retired already. The what is kind of different than it's ever been before. But you have a purpose for us even when we're retired. So I pray, Jesus, that you would help every one of us here to know your purpose, that you would give us the gift of faith so that we can trust your purpose. And then, Jesus, help us to know that each one of us is special. Help each one of us to know that we are unique. Help each one of us to know that we are a masterpiece formed by your own hands. And may that assurance give us the strength and courage we need to live into your purpose. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.